So welcome everyone to, to uh, the session, the, our fourth session of our In Dialogue seminar series. The first three sessions were co-hosted with the Global Lear House. Thank you very much for that cooperation. I see some of the people uh, from that uh, um, uh, constituency here and also from the German Philosophy Seminar at the School of Advanced Study. Um, from now, we'll, we'll have uh, three more sessions. Um, three, I think, yeah. Yeah, we have three more sessions in which we'll continue our exploration, obviously, onto there as well, right, onto uh, continue our exploration of the, the actuality of some of Buber's ideas for thinking through contemporary issues. Last week, we had a wonderful session on environmental ethics and the climate catastrophe, catastrophe that is uh, upon us. Um, and rethinking our relationship to nature from a dialogical perspective. And today we're going to look um, at the, the political sphere. And um, we're going to do that in a format that is slightly different from the previous three sessions. We, in the, in, the, in the session today and also in the remaining other sessions, we do not have a panel uh, that will have a discussion and then a plenary discussion, but we'll have the introduction of the topic by one speaker and after that, we will have a, pl a plenary dialogue about the topic. There has been some pre-reading, um, which you have um, uh, maybe had a look at. You can download it on the SAS website through which you have registered. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, a little fragment from uh, uh, The Kingship of God and a few pages from I and Thou. And the speaker for today who is going to introduce our topic is Federico Filari. For many of you, he needs no introduction. He is a doctoral candidate at the Ernst Bloch Center here at the School of Advanced Study and is writing um, a thesis about the messianic motif in German Jewish thought, focusing especially on Ernst Bloch and considering that motif in the light of his relevance for contemporary political theology. And in the context of that work, I think he's a, a very good speaker for our topic today. Uh, he suggested that we look at the charismatic leader and the life of the community. In recent years, the political landscape in Western democracies has changed drastically. The surge of populist movements reflects a lack of democracies, <coughs> sorry, reflects a lack of capacity of traditional political formations to deal with the necessities of the population, especially the marginalized and the underprivileged. While these needs are more and more pressing, the movement's leadership all too often take a conservative, if not despotic turn, with a charismatic leader holding sway over large groups of the populace. How are we to understand the role of charisma within the, public, the political sphere? Is it a mere instrument of power? Or can it, can it itself be the basis for the construction of dialogue and foster the life of the political community? Can Buber's reflections around theocracy and theopolitics lead us to problematize the notion of charisma and to cast new light on the nature and limits of political agency. I'll hand over to Federico to introduce this topic for us and then we can have a discussion. And as always, you can post any questions in the meantime while Federico is talking in the chat. And also later on, you can either uh, raise your hand to make a comment or put a question in the chat and I'll keep an eye on it. Federico, over to you. Many, many thanks, Jorn, for the introduction and good afternoon to, to everyone. It's good to see that we are in a way merging two groups, one from the Lehr House and the other one from the IMLR German, uh, German Philosophy Seminar at London. And um, thanks for, uh, for being here. So yes, the topic um, that I want to deal with today is the one of uh, the charismatic leadership. I think in the first of our sessions, we, we dealt already with the problematics uh, pertaining to the political sphere in this uh, current moment. And we have already touched upon uh, some of the topics I will deal with today. I hope that um, uh, the quotes that I have selected from one specific work by Buber um, will cast some new light on the um, on the debate that we already had. Um, I have a presentation with, with some slides that I will um, that I will read and I will I will show it with you. Um, so it will be 
like a, roughly half an hour, 40 minutes of presentation. Uh, and um, you're very welcome to, to put your, your questions in the chat in the meantime, and then later on we can have um, a discussion. So uh, now I'll um, share my screen. Okay. Good. Is it um, correctly displayed? Can someone just confirm? Yep. Yes, okay, great. So, um, my um, presentation will be divided roughly in three parts. The, the first one is just an introduction uh, and I will deal with uh, some, some questions, uh, some of them quite urgent that are posed by uh, what we are facing in, uh, by in, in the current political panorama. By current, I, I don't mean just the last year, but the last 10, 15 years. Um, and to understand and to pose the question, I will um, expand on uh, Max Weber's notion of charisma or charismatic leadership. After this, I will then consider um, what Buber um, described in his, in his uh, book, um, The Kingship of God or Connectum Gottes. And uh, this will be the last, uh, the, the, mm, the longest session of uh, the section of, of this talk. And so I will deal with uh, some paradoxes uh, and some dangers of the charismatic leadership in the context of the ancient Israel theocracy. And then I will uh, move on to uh, discuss possibility of reading charisma as spirit, um, with spirit, I mean the um, the, 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 with the Hebrew term ruach, um, and for that I will uh, rely on some quotes from Ayan Tao. After all, I'll uh, present some tentative answers to uh, the question that questions that I'm going to uh, to raise. Now, um, I will present uh, a very sketchy view of uh, one of the. Uh, problems that I see uh, that are arising in, 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 in the political panorama. And one thing, one phenomenon that is quite clear is that of populism. And if we look at um, Western Europe and North America, we, um, of course, we, we cannot um, oversee the, the rise of right-wing populism. Um, uh, here there are just uh, some examples. There's Donald Trump in the US, um, Theo Salvini in Italy, Marine Le Pen quite recently, uh, she, um, she stood uh, as a candidate for uh, the elections in France. Uh, but beside the right-wing populism, there is, there's also uh, a left-wing populism. Um, another couple of examples are um, Potemos, uh, uh, with his, uh, the, re the leader, um, Pedro, and, and, and uh, the Five Star Movement in Italy with Papa Grillo. Um, so there is this first phenomenon, populism, broadly understood, or what usually uh, political scholars, um, political science scholars recognize in it is the opposition between the people and the elite. Um, but there are other features uh, that are also specific of each kind of uh, populist movement or populist party. If we uh, broaden the spectrum, if we if we look at Eastern Eastern Europe and, and and Eastern Europe and Russia, quasi democracies or those nations that um, are a kind of a hybrid between um, authoritarian regimes and and proper democracies we see the rise of authoritarian leaders. Now, in both cases, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm oversimplifying this, but I'm, I'm interested in only one specific aspect that is common to, um, to both these um, this broad spheres, both um, North America and Western Europe and Eastern Europe and, and Asia. In, in both cases, um, we see that the, these movements are led by charismatic leaders or what they are usually described as charismatic leaders. So they are soul leaders. There's, um, um, one of the features is, uh, of these movements is a high, highly stressed personalism, almost a cult of the persona in certain cases. And it, these leaders have 
exceptional characteristics or to them or, or the, the general public um, recognizes exceptional characteristics that make up this this charisma usually these are tied to um, their ability to to deal with difficult situations to provide immediate answers and uh, to um, and an exceptional uh, rhetorical capacity with rhetoric, the ability of, of, of giving very convincing speech. They also lay claim of embodying the will of the people, of um, the general will. This is also um, a notion we've uh, touched upon in our first um, session. So there is this, um, this claim. The consequence for the political life is uh, that there is a high centralization of power. All decisions are centralized and the deliberative processes, rather than, than being uh, shared, rather than being, um, rather, rather than having um, a, a broad discussion, there is a hierarchical uh, deliberative process, process and very often an authoritative one uh, where the leader takes decision and uh, the others obey. Sometimes uh, the, um, this leads even to a repression of the freedom of speech and expression. And here, probably, I'm just stressing the fact that it's quite paradoxical for a movement that claims to um, to to represent the uh, underprivileged, the, the marginalized, or the people against the the elite. So when facing uh, these uh, contradictions, um, and when facing the rising of um, very um, very authoritative but also charismatic leaders in the political panorama, um, we might ra uh, raise some questions. And what is if if uh, we agree that what is common to all these forms of leadership is uh, the fact that charisma is recognized in them, then we have to point to, to question what is charisma and how, how we to read, to understand it. And is it good or bad for the political sphere? Is it dangerous? We've, we've seen uh, and we've discussed even the, the almost despotic turn that in certain cases, um, a charismatic leader at the head of uh, a political body might lead to but on the other hand, there are some populist movements uh, that um, even today and in, in the past might have seen as um, even emancipatory in the name of the people. So uh, th this is one of the main, uh, the main questions that I'd like to raise, whether what are the consequences of, um, of charisma in the political sphere? But if we assume it can endanger uh, the, the life of the community, do we have to, to dispense with it altogether? Can we have a political sphere without charismatic leaders? Is it uh, just a government of technocrats? Is technocracy something that could help us to, to, to prevent uh, to prevent us from slipping into um, autocracies or into um, the despotic um, and authoritarian regimes? To answer this, I will first um, deal with the notion of charisma as it was developed by, by Max Weber. Uh, he, um, Max Weber, um, uh, a German sociologist, uh, active towards the end of the 19th, early 20th century, probably needs no presentation, but he dealt with this uh, problem in, in um, a seminal essay uh, written in 1922, so exactly 100 years ago in which he was dealing with the problem of legitimacy. So he was uh, trying to understand and provide a theory for um, what, what are the bases for a leader to be obeyed by and, for, and, and to be trusted by, by people. And he identified three ways of legitimize the authority Authority is a, um, a translation um, which is not exactly overlapping with the meaning of Herrschaft, but is the closest to it. So he identified three kinds of authority over the course of history. Uh, the first one is legal authority, uh, whereby 
the obedience to uh, those in power depends on um, on the laws that are currently enforced. And there is a procedure to which one has to go if one wants to change and modify those uh, those laws. So there is no cult of the persona, there is no personalism, but the um, Co the cohesion of uh, the society is ensured by uh, this uh, system of jurisprudence. And he uh, proposes that the pure form, the, 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 the most prominent examples are, are bureaucracies. So uh, most prominently state uh, bureaucracy, but he also talks about uh, big companies and corporations. The, sec the second type of um, legitimate uh, of, of legitimacy is the one that derives from tradition, traditional authority. The main tenet, the main um, claim that there is that the social order is sacred and is maintained constant through uh, history. So there's no change and any possible, any, any attempt to change uh, a structure that is, um, that has or always been the same is seen as illegitimate. So the obedience to those in power in, in the case of traditional authority depends on uh, what has been done in the past and on uh, the fact that it's um, almost hollowed the, 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 the traditional, the traditional, um, the traditional form of power. And the, the pure forms that, um, or examples that Weber proposes are that of the patriarchal authority, where the persona who um, holds sway of, of the community is uh, the, the pater familias uh, or the Lord. But also another example is that of the estate system in uh, pre-modern um, pre societies. Lastly, he presents uh, the, um, the, 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 the third kind of uh, legitimate authority, which is the charismatic authority. And he says that it rests, I'm quoting, on the affectual and personal devotion of the follower to the Lord and his gifts of grace, charisma. So in this case, there, um, there is um, a highly personalized form of power, and the uh, and obedience depends on the recognition on of a capacity of the leader. This capacity is understood uh, by Max Weber uh, as a gift, uh, gifts of grace. He says explicit explicitly, and he calls this um, charisma. Um, it must be noted that. Um, he uh, explicitly says that his understanding of charisma is value, um, um, is, uh, uh, sorry, um, he, he doesn't bestow a positive, an intrinsically positive value on this, on this, it's value neutral, his understanding of charisma. So there's no evaluation of the moral stance of, of the bearers of, of the charisma. Uh, and in the, in the various examples he provides, so the, the prophet, but also the warrior hero or the great demagogue, what is important is that there is the recognition of those who obey of this exceptional capacity of, um, of the leader. We might say in using already for, uh, a notion we've discussed uh, at length, that there is monodirectional trust. Namely, the people put their trust in the leader. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's also vice versa, that the leader then trusts uh, the, uh, each and every um, citizen or each and every of his uh, subordinates. But this notion of, uh, of charisma I argue that it's, it could be, and in fact, it has been problematized uh, with a different nuance by Martin Buber, and uh, where he used this um, to, to talk about a specific case. Um, and I'd like to now open this um, second part of the talk 
and delve a bit deeper in, into um, Buber's scholarship and particularly into, into what he wrote in Conictum Gottes or The Kingship of God. The book appeared in 1932 and it was initially part of a, a more um, a broader project uh, dedicated to the exploration of the origin of the mess of messianism in Israel. And this is the first, um, the first book dedicated to this. It is also uh, meant to, to demonstrate uh, his, his um, scholarly value and to qualify him for a university appointment. And in fact, for, for those who are um, used to read Buber, uh, it's, it's also quite an unusual text because it's extremely academic in the way he, he provides and uh, he deals with the different concepts. And he kept it updated with the uh, uh, when he was reissued and, re and republished, uh, responding to, uh, to his critics. The main aim of this book is to prove the historical reality of what he describes as Jewish theocracy. He deals with a particular period of uh, the history of Israel, namely after the, um, the Exodus and before um, the, the 12 tribes of Israel uh, were unified uh, into a, a monarchic entity. So it's pre-monarchic Israel. To uh, present the status of uh, Israel at that time, he argues that that one is a, must be understood as theocracy. He distinguishes theocracy from hierocracy, also following Max Faber in this. So he says that um, hierocracy would be uh, the dominion or the sovereignty held by the priestly class, whereas theocracy is the direct sovereignty of the only legitimate ruler, and the only legitimate ruler is God. And to the, the, the point of departure for this is uh, a comment on uh, a passage in the book of the judges, and particularly the one concerning uh, one of the judges, the judge Gideon. I'm um, now reading out loud the, the, this quote, which is from the eighth chapter uh, of, the book of, Gideon, of the book of Judges. Then the men of Israel say to Gideon, rule over us, both of you, and you, your son, and your son's son, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said to them, I shall not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. Yeveh will rule over you. End quote. So he, in, this, in this extract from the book of, um, these two verses of the book of uh, Judges, in the refusal to accept uh, to accept the, um, the monarchic role uh, or the role as a king, uh, refusal of, of, uh, um, of, of, of being, um, of receiving the, the, the um, kingly rule, Buber, see, uh, Buber recognizes uh, the proper form of, um, of, of the ancient uh, Israeli uh, theocracy. And he sees two different sides of it. There's a positive and a negative content. And he comments on this, um, looking at, um, looking at the, the Sinai covenant, the covenant between um, men and God. I'm quoting it again. I'm quoting again from uh, the kingship of God. The covenant of Sinai signifies, according to its positive content, that the wandering tribes accept Yahweh forever and ever as their king. According to its negative content, it signifies that no man is to be called king of the sons of Israel. It's not, it's not difficult to notice that in, if one follows the path of the negative content, there, there is a strong anarchic claim here because this entails the delegitimation of any uh, earthly, this worldly form of power, because the only legitimate form of power is that um, 
is the one that recognizes positively Yahweh as the ruler. Now, this uh, this is the, the, the core of um, Buber's anarcho-theocracy. And if we, if we read with, uh, um, with uh, Brody, um, the, 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 the quote here below, um, he, he describes Brody as a contemporary scholar, and he describes this um, paradoxical form of, uh, of government as an archotheocracy in these terms. I'm quoting again, internally, the people feel themselves to be under an invisible government, and externally, there appears to be no government at all. So there is something invisible that holds sway of the people in uh, in, in, the, in a direct form of, of theocracy. This, of course, presents um, a paradox, a paradox that was very, very clear to, to Buber and that he addresses um, in this with his words. I'm quoting now from the kingship of God. The paradox of every original and direct theocracy that it involves the intractableness of the human person, the drive of man to be independent of man, but for the sake of a higher commitment, already appears in the Sinai Covenant. The existential depth of this paradox shows itself in this, that the highest commitment, according to its nature, knows no compulsion, that its fulfillment is accordingly surrendered in every moment to the faith domain of the one who is inbound who is bound, who, bidden by the commitment, can either strive towards a complete community out of free will, a divine kingdom, or letting himself be covered by the vacation thereto, can degenerate into an indolent or brutalized subordination. So the paradox is here that the, the highest point in the most important uh, bound for the community, the most important um, political point depends on something that is that entails no compulsion, no obligation. That there is only uh, that that each of the members uh, of the community is free to um, subscribe to, and the leader itself can uh, freely, um, in a way, subscribe to uh, the call and obey to the call, or else um, there, there, is the, there is also the possibility uh, of a degeneration into a form of, of subordination or a form of anarchy on the other, on the other hand. So the, the way Buber presents um, Jewish direct theocracy is a form of power whereby uh, there is a, a paradoxical core. Now, how are we to understand uh, the, this invisible form of government? How is it exercised, actually? And this is uh, the point where Buber uses the, the notion of charisma. In a way, charisma acts almost as a mediation between uh, the um, the, the um, rulership of God and the community and someone within the community uh, recognized as um, bestowed with uh, or someone upon which is bestowed the, the gift of, uh, of, of charisma. And uh, this is uh, what Wabubur um, says about this, I'm quoting, the charismatic, which deals seriously with uh, its experience, is now obliged to base its institutional structure upon manifestations of the charis, to incorporate these accordingly as the most real of all into stable political reality, into permanent presuppositions of political life and action. Accordingly, to base theopolitics no longer merely on covenant, covenant and statute, also no longer simply to verify it in the carrying out of covenant and statute, but also to exercise theopolitics, even when it is a matter of letting the charis all hold sway beyond the actual charisma." End quote. So 
Buber proposes two levels uh, to understand charisma. One is the actual charisma and the embodiment of which uh, is visible, recognizable in a person that is the leader of the community. The other one, the other side is what I'd, I interpreted as, as the spiritual side, the charis. The charis inhabits the charismatic leader, but can also fade away. It is extremely uh, feeble in a way, and for this also extremely unstable. Um, but it is the task of the charismatic leader to incorporate, to embed uh, the manifestations of charis or the spiritual elements, the gift into uh, what he says, it's a stable political reality into the day-to-day -day deliberative processes or in the language of Ayan Tao, into the world of it. So there is this distinction and what is like of paramount importance uh, seems to be uh, that the, 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 the spiritual aspect, the charis, holds prominence and, is, uh, uh, and, and must be uh, held into the, in a higher position rather than the uh, charismatic leadership. So there is always uh, the precedence according to the spiritual, um, the spiritual aspect uh, compared to the um, to the this worldly um, ma management and administration of the community. Here we, we can also notice that there are similarities, but also uh, differences between Weber's notion of charisma and Buber's one. In, for both, charisma is understood as a gift, so not something that is in the, automatically developed or in or uh, by by the leader in weber there is there are some references to a magical origin of uh, um, of this gift uh, for buber it's clearly a divine there's clearly divine origin um, uh, a gift of grace but as i said before for weber there is a value neutral account of charisma so one we, we could have um, a very bad-natured person who is extremely charismatic. For Buber, I'd say there is a value positive um, account of charisma because charisma in this case is bound to the capacity to engender authentic relationships based on trust. And uh, for, for, for Weber, charisma is something that we can detect, so to say, from the outside uh, from uh, the, the, the feats of a hero or from the rhetorical uh, abilities of someone who is very able in, in, on a, on, in public debates or for speech. Whereas uh, the, the most important characteristic of Buber's account of charisma, in Buber's account of charisma, is uh, that the capacity to inspire an I thou relation, the capacity to uh, engender a dialogical relation to the other and not reifying it. So contrasting uh, Buber's and, and Weber's account of charisma allows us also to, uh, to rethink the very capacity, the very notion of, of charisma we are dealing with. And in both cases, in both cases, we have um, trust that it, there is one over by, by the people towards the leader, but we might argue in Buber's notion of charisma, the charismatic leader, the one who holds charis, um, uh, do less charis holds way, is there also the one able to be present in the fullness of his being towards the other people. And this characteristic is not present necessarily in Weber's account. Both of them, both Weber and, and Buber were uh, very well aware of the dangers of charismatic authority. As I said before, Buber pointed out that the, there is the possibility for, um, a, a, for a, a charismatic leadership to, to degenerate 
It could be either an, what is said, an indolent and brutalized subordination, but also, on the other hand, it could degenerate into empty anarchy or, or absence of authority, precisely because it, it doesn't coalesce into um, a fixed and strict um, system of laws, but it depends on uh, the fluctuating spirit. Um, and this poses a problem, a problem that Buber um, understands in these terms, I'm quoting. The result of this is that the truth of the principle must be fought for, fought for religio-politically. The venture of a radical theocracy must therefore lead to the bursting forth of the opposition latent in every people. Those, however, who in this fight represent the case of, for divine rulership against that of history, experience therein the first shudder of eschatology. The full paradoxical character of the human attitude of faith is only began in the situation of the individual with all its depths. It is developed only in the real relationship of this individual to a world which does not want to be God's and to a God who does not want to compel the world to become his, end quote. So the mm, Buber here suggests that there is a fight, an inner struggle, and he calls this an, a religio-political struggle. Later on, he will also introduce the notion of, of theopolitics. So there is a religious element, uh, the element of recognition of what in Iron Thou he calls the eternal Thou. And then there is the political stance, the political level, namely the way a leader uh, leads this community, leads his, um, his people. And this opposition is on the one hand, uh, an opposition within the population for those who uh, adhere to uh, the notion of, of, of direct theocracy and those who counter it or, or, or don't believe in it. But more, um, even more of that, there is an opposition e inside each individual, um, each of the Einzelnen. In, it, it is a, a contrast and a struggle that we experience ourselves within our depths. And again, he um, restates that uh, there's no compulsion. So the, the relationship with this God is the relation to a God, he says, who doesn't want to compel the world to become his. So there is an element of freedom. And again, uh, this is probably the anarchic core of this, um, of, of this uh, doctrine. Now, the, the question becomes, how is it possible to let the carousel's way if we follow Buber. And here I suggest that we can um, understand the charis in the same, through the term ruach, so the term spirit, and we can look at I and thou and how he uh, describes the, the notion of, of spirit. Because the, uh, one, one can, can argue that even if this is a um, theological, political, or a religious political struggle, even without the acknowledgement of an external divine hypostasis, so the, the belief in, in God as an external entity, still we can uh, um, subscribe to this model. In I and Thou, he says the spirit in its human manifestation is a response of man to his Thou. So insofar as each individual within himself or themselves are, is able to respond uh, to his Thou or to her Thou, then we have the possibility of, of letting the charis hold sway. So it seems that um, our capacity our, of our individual capacity to develop this relation to our inborn Tao is on a religious ethical exercise on the one hand, and on the other, a theopolitical act. 
So it's not just a spiritual or an ethical act, but it's ipso facto, it's in itself a political act for the way we then express it publicly in the life of our community. And especially if we're talking about the leader of community, this is uh, the reflection of, of his inner struggle is displayed in the, the way he understands uh, his political agency. So if to um, open the last parenthesis um, following, uh, following Buber and I and Thau, I'm prone to understand and to explain charisma as a, as a spirit, as I said, as a ruach. And uh, I, I selected a couple of, of um, quotes from I and Thau to understand what he, uh, what he proposes. So he says, I'm quoting, the communal life of man can no more than man himself dispense with the world of it, over which the presence of the Thou moves like spirit upon the face of the waters. Man's will to prosper and to be powerful have the natural and proper effect so long as they are linked with and upheld with his will to enter into relation. End quote. I think that this very brief section of I and Thou perfectly um, can be perfectly put in parallel with the notion of holding or of letting the charisma hold his way. First, okay, he he um, uh, he evokes this very uh, beautiful image from Genesis of the spirit hovering over the face of the waters before creation. And, and he says, okay, this is, uh, this is what nourishes and what has to imbue the world of it, the world of um, political administration, economic administration, and so on. At the same time, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't deny the importance of uh, man's will to prosper, so of economy and to be powerful and of politics, so he uh, endorses the political and economic activities in the world of it, in the world of uh, the administration. But he claims that uh, the proper effect, so the, mm, the optimal political and economic activity can be uh, realized only insofar and only dependent on uh, the man's will to enter into relation, man's will to speak with uh, their own thou. This has an effect, of course, for the uh, for the life of the of the community itself, and it has to do with what puts all holds the community together. In the at the right hand side of the of the screen, there is a there is a, another quote that was also in the readings for uh, for today about the true life of community. Now I'm going to read it out loud. The true community does not arise through people's having feelings for one another, though indeed not without it, but through first the taking the stand in living mutual relation with a living center, and second their being in living mutual relation with one another. The community is built up of living mutual relation, but the builder is the living effective center. Now there is a, end quote, uh, there is a, um, a scholarly debate about what Buber meant with the center uh, or um, with the builder of the community. I'd like to point to another section of the book in which he talks about the center. And that's the quote on the left. The world of it is set in context of space and time. The world of Tao is not set in, in the context of either of these. Its context is the center where the extended lines of relations meet in the eternal Tao, end quote. So, there is a theological element, the eternal Tao, that nourishes and that nourishes the center of the community. So the builder of the community might well be 
a human builder, might well be, in other terms, a charismatic leader, but the community is unliving and it can work properly only insofar as this charismatic leader is linked to or uh, is prone to recognize the eternal Tao. So there is an inborn Tao that he has to recognize and then an eternal Tao. There is a theological aspect in it. And only insofar as the eternal Tao is recognized and welcomed, then the community is a true community, seems to be. This leads me to uh, the, the conclusion, to some tentative answers to the questions that I, that I posed earlier about, sorry, about uh, my, um, about the, 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 the current political situation and then the questions that it poses to us. So the first thing is that uh, the good politics uh, depends on the will and capacity of each individual to let the carries all its way, which means that there is an ethical choice that the, and, and an inner struggle within peoples and within individuals. And this is the most relevant and, 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 and the core of any good political outcome. So the capacity to enter into a relation with the fullness of one's being. And it is this one, the extraordinary quality of the good charismatic leader. So we sh there's a shift in the understanding of what a charismatic leader means. And the, the extraordinary quality is precisely this of engendering uh, proper uh, I thou relationships. The second point uh, is that in general, when we talk about charismatic leadership, we might, we, I, I'd like to argue that it's not something intrinsically detrimental to the political life. But in any case, it is extremely important that we seek a, a distinction, that we are able to identify what kind of charismatic leadership we are facing um, in, at each instantiation of charisma, at each case in which we are presented with um, charismatic leader. So questioning, so to say, its source or testing the genuine nature of it. Again, there is this inner struggle uh, to be fought theopolitically. The third one is just a comment about the um, what we mean by uh, the or how to circumscribe the political sphere. And I argue that the political sphere shouldn't be limited to the legal aspects of an administration of power. So not just tied to, uh, the, um, to, to, to laws, to the jurisprudential issues, and not just tied to discussions related to positive law. And instead there are other direct uh, the dimensions of the political, which are inextricably bound with it. The ethical, so the realm of, of the choices, and the theological or metaphysical and ultimately the legitimation uh, of which also Weber was talking about finds its, its origin in this, um, in this last um, sphere. And um, sorry, incidentally, one, it, I can, or, um, I can uh, stress that this is not completely dissimilar from what Schmidt, Karl Schmidt, uh, um, German uh, jurist, theorized in his 1922 essay, Political Theology, but it operates in a diametrically opposite direction. In fact, Buber calls this, calls this theopolitics, and he, he says this is an action of a public nature from the point of view of the tendency towards the actualization of divine rulership. And with this, I um, conclude and I <laughs> welcome uh, questions and, and, and comments uh, even from, from you. So many thanks. <laughs> thanks, Federico. Thanks very much for, for this very clear introduction of the notion of charisma and the charismatic and um, opening it up for us to start to explore it a little bit deeper with respect to the 
the current political realities that we are living in. Um, and I think you made a, a very uh, wise choice to focus on this notion of charisma, because as I was listening to your presentation, I was beginning to see it uh, everywhere, not just in the populist leaders that we have today, but also in maybe the sort of big brother informal, informal colloquialism of people like Trudeau and uh, Macron and um, leaders like that, uh, Johnson maybe even also the chappy attitude. Uh, that's also a kind of charisma, isn't it? That's also a kind of um, personal authority on the basis of which people speak. Um, and we might even um, ask the question whether Zelensky is a charismatic leader. Um, so uh, lo lots to talk about. And I think the, the idea would be to now uh, have a kind of plenary conversation in which we try to work with these ideas and see how they can help us to understand the, the, the contemporary situation. People are very welcome to put questions in the chat and also to just raise your hand and make a comment. It doesn't have to be a question. Make a comment in, um, in, in person. And I'm just looking at the chat. I have kept an eye on it. Um, and we, we started actually quite early. Uh, um, maybe Federico, you could, or, or maybe uh, uh, Hune, or if I hope I pronounced his name correctly, you had a question. Would you would you care to voice it uh, uh, in person? No. Maybe he's not paying attention right now. The question was, and maybe it's a good place to start our discussion. Uh, Federico, can you clarify if there is a distinction between obedience and general compliance with the authority of law? Because you made a big distinction between uh, the rule of law and the rule of the charismatic leader, but um, how does obedience relate to the rule of law? Well, I think that the question was raised in relation to uh, that point of my talk when I was dealing with um, Max Weber's distinction of the three kinds of um, uh, legitimate uh, rulership, legitimate authority. And I'd say that uh, compliance with the authority or, or the law is something that takes place only within the Rechtsstaat or the state of law, of course. So it is one specific, um, one specific way to understand obedience. Uh, but in, in general, um, obedience could be also obedience to a friend or obedience to um, a person, a master or a leader. And so in, also in other kinds of um, political rulership or, or, or in other kinds of, of, of authority, um, it, 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 it is still valid, namely uh, just um, abiding by uh what uh, the uh, or following the command of um, of the leader in this sense, but this is obedience understood in a political sense. Of course, there, there are other kinds of obedience. I'd say, um, for example, like on a on if if we um, move from the realm of of politics to a sheer spiritual um, realm, there is also the obedience of and adapt to, to the master or to the spiritual guide, for example. And in that sense, there's no compliance with the law, there's no law, there's guidance. Um, so I'd say that obedience is a, is a wider concept. Um, when we talk about uh, specifically um, the state of law, then the two corresponds. But in, 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 in the other cases, I'd, I'd suggest that it's, it's wider. I don't know whether this is uh, exactly what um, you, who now were uh, thinking about. I don't know whether you want to reply on that. No, no, I've got, <clears throat> uh, thank you. I, I think you have uh, uh, clarified the point uh, because we have, to, we have to make sure that uh, when Buber was referring to the biblical text, the biblical God demands absolute obedience. So I, I don't, uh, when we put it in the context of the biblical text, uh, this is obedience that has consequences uh, and eliminates the possibility of free choice <clears throat> because the consequences of free choice are the damnation of, 
of the of that those who do not comply. So I, I was always concerned that the, the, the point of obedience, uh, when we translate that into the political realm, we're, we're talking about the theocratic religious aspect of it, uh, that, that we, there has to be some way in which we clarify that the obedience to God will always be manifested through compliance with the, with the demands of the clergy, or whoever has been appointed to be the speaker for God, the interpreter, uh, those that, that write the religious books. <clears throat> and I believe that to some extent, Buber did not deal with that directly. He, he took the text and, and he did not look at the, at the actual historic context of the, uh, uh, like we, we spoke, you spoke of Gideon uh, and saying, I, I will not rule over you, only God will. But, but there were the judges, there were other, other people who were actually ruling in the name, in the name of God. Yeah, um, if I, I have um, just one um, remark. You said that um, obedience to God doesn't, doesn't allow um, any, any form of freedom um, because otherwise there is just damnation. Um, I think uh, if, I, if I got it correctly, I think that that is probably a restrictive way of looking at it because um, there's also the, the God who forgives. I mean, um, I'm, I'm not the most qualified person to talk about this, but in, in, in the Jewish tradition, there are at least two uh, quite opposing countenances of God. So there is always love and wrath. So it, it's, um, it's true that not obeying or not abiding, abiding by God's command engenders wrath, but there's always the the God that has turned the way and the, the, turned the face and the side apart from the people sooner or later will come back because it's the, the beloved people. So it's I think not unilateral, and so this um, might maintain. Uh, the, the 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 centrality of of human freedom and and freedom to to choose whether to obey or not of course there is like one uh the right choice and the wrong choice so to say uh but this doesn't eliminate it doesn't wipe off the uh the freedom of the individual and therefore it doesn't wipe off the inner struggle of each individual to the second point that you raise about the clergy um I think that to some extent this in this book that was the first attempt because it, he recognized it, the first attempt to, to deal with uh, this, this problem because he recognized the role of the judges. He recognized the role of, of Gideon, um, and which for sure was also uh, a, a crucially important role in terms of his capacity to, to defend the tribes from uh, the attacks that were coming from, from the other uh, from the other um, political formation that were that were endangering uh, the the, tr the twelve tribes, and at the same time there is a subtle um, there is this subtle um, um, yeah mechanism if if you want that uh, that takes place there where in in Gideon's uh, acknowledgement that he is not the ruler. He admits that there is something over, and so that his power is completely limited. So there is a limitation of the, this worldly power that depends on, uh, um, on, 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 on a gift, on, on what he describes as uh, the, the spirit that might come and might go. It's something fluctuating. And there is, of course, the temptation of almost entrapping, almost um, crystallizing this, um, the, the charismatic leadership into a form of institutionalized version. And this is probably what you, um, very similar to what you meant when you said, okay, there is the, the power of the church, the power of uh, the, 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 the clergy or, or, the, or the, the rabbis. So there, there was a, an, an attempt to, um, constrain and, and to encapsulate this fluctuating spirit into a structure, uh, but 
the, the question is precisely whether we're able to, to avoid that. Uh, I'm just adding one more, one more thing uh, in terms of what you were speaking of before, uh, the God that forgives. In the Bible, the God that forgives is one that uh, you have accepted his commandments. It's a teshuva, it's a return, it's a repentance. <laughs> So the Bible says, I give you, God says, I give you life and I give you death. You choose life. The choice has already been made. So there is, there is a, a sense of uh, uh, compassion, but only for those who have returned. Those who have not returned, <clears throat> they do not. And the last, the last thing I just uh, mentioned, uh, uh, you know, in the Jewish uh, tradition, uh, there is the oral law, the halakha, that clearly says, whatever commandments we got from God, <clears throat> we don't understand what they mean. Uh, but there is another meaning that was passed on orally to the Kohanim or to whoever was decided at the time. For instance, what does it mean? Uh, don't mix uh, milk and, and, and meat. So wh whatever there is a, a, a theocracy of this kind in which God is the commander in chief, there has to be somebody who explains what does God mean? And that person obtains the authority. But like you mentioned before, his authority comes completely from abiding to the law. It's not something that he does not make the law. Uh, if he strays just even a little bit, right? Like in the Sabbath, he would light up a cigarette, he will be considered to be a heretic. So you do need to have the institutions, but the institutions are based on law. But to what extent that law was made by the leaders of the institutions is what the entire religious history of the, of the Jews has been fluctuating from this end to the next till this very modern time where we have the reformed uh, parts of Judaism that say, let's go back to, the, to, to the, whatever it is the original that they can see as original, as opposed to what has been accrued over the generations. What is the role of the law in this, uh, in this, in this very individualistic spiritual notion of the charismatic? Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'd say that one thing is the, um, like as you said, Huna, uh, the provide an interpretation of the text and explanation. Uh, that then becomes uh, that then becomes uh, the the law or the or the, a reading of the halakha um, is is one thing. I would say that there. It seems to me, at least, that in Buber there is um, first of all like a stance or a perspective from which we. Uh, look at the text, the sacred text, and which we, uh, and from which we interpret the law. It's not that the law is absent, of course, and I'm not proposing that we should dispense at all with the uh, with laws and and, and uh, any jurisprudential um, aspects, both inside and outside of Judaism. The point is that each of the interpretations of the law can point towards. Um, oversimplifying can point towards a, a merely applica crude application of norms or it could uh, take each of the, uh, of, of, of the norms and, and, and try to use them to and live in the community and to engender this sense of, of dialogue. So law is not alien. It's not, I wouldn't say that law is alien to or, or, or um, in contradiction to um, the possibility to have a, a dialogic uh, community. Uh, but those in charge or those who are um, understood as the, the um, those who hold the, the, the charisma have also the, the task of uh, providing an interpretation of the law, which is, um, which leads to uh, the, the creation of a sense of community, I would say. So it's not just the, the, the 
taken into consideration or or, or letting the low go uh, letting the low go but is um molded the way we we read it and we provide interpretations for it but this is what i would um answer to 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 this question i don't know whether other people have um, yeah. uh, thanks Rune, and thanks for this i mean this begins to touch on a very very the very, very important question why in you might say in the if you want to tell a very broad story, you could say there has been a, a total demise of the political sphere in liberal democracies. Uh, why? Under the influence of maybe new technologies or the general depravity of mankind, we don't know. But we're in a situation in which charisma means PR quality. And, and in a way, you are trying to say that in order to restore a kind of relationality at the heart of politics, we need to rethink, or we can maybe look at how Buber rethinks this notion of charisma to uh, f- to find a f- find a new way forward that does not rely on. You could easily say that charisma is just Habermas's ideal speech situation in which we all just listen to each other, um, but something more seems to be involved. And we're trying to explore, I think, what what that is and what this dialogic notion can can do to help us think about that. I was just trying to sum up the the conversation. Uh, and the divine law is not a positive law. So, so what law means in, when we speak of Torah or divine divine law is is a wholly uh, unanswered question in, in a way. Um, Fake, I believe you wanted to, to make an intervention. Uh, I just wanted to stand back a bit because, well, two things. One, I, th- I was really helpful. Um, the distinction between Weber and Buber, and somehow thinking that Buber was moving in a different direction and wanting there to be some notion of trust. And, and in that way, rethinking what we might think about the notion of good authority. What do we mean by good authority? Now, how do we want to think about that? But I found this piece really difficult to read. I thought it was really complicated, the booba. Um, so I wanted to just pull Paul into the conversation and know something a bit about the context in which this work was written and what was motivating it because but you said very quickly it was he was doing it in order to get a job almost um so i was wondering both the circumstances in germany that he was writing against you know um and questions the theolo- theolo- political questions that were emerging in germany at that time but also what i was struck by was the difference in style between the portion that you gave about I and thou and the kind of poetic framing of that. And this very different kind of almost historical writing where you almost, I had to think about what was really interesting about it was the shifting notions of authority and power that Buber was exploring, that there wasn't just, it wasn't like the Weber, here are these distinctions between traditional, rational and charismatic, Buber was showing through these historical shifts in great detail, there were very different notions of authority and obedience at work. Um, But he never really characterizes it. You know, he he kind of sets it out. But I was left feeling uneasy about what really is at issue here. So I thought just stepping back a bit, thinking about the context in which particularly this large um, paper that Buber wrote. What, what was his purpose? What was the intention, both in terms of the moment of writing, but also the kind of uneasy tension between that and the stylistic framing of Iron Lau? Very different kind of writing, very different kind of sensibility, very different kind of movement. And I think you did a real, go- real good job in trying to kind of connect the two but I'm wondering how and whether it's possible. You, you mean connecting uh, I and Thou to, to uh, Connectum Gottes? Or, yeah. Mm. Something about there's such different um, style, styles, such different kind of intentions in the writing. So I just thought it was useful. You tend to put them together in a kind of helpful way towards the end. Yeah. But well, it left me with more questions about what the historical context, the time it was written, and what Buber was on about 
what he really wanted to get out of. And sometimes that, that's there in other writings with Buber. There's a real tension between the different kinds of styles we adopt. And in the seminar, we tended to focus on Iron Thou as the kind of the framing, the real Buber at some level. But how we put it together in tension with his other writings, I just thought was worth reflecting about. Yeah. No, thanks for the for the question, Vic. Um, yes, I, I I mentioned the the context very very in a very sketchy way, but probably it's worth saying that yeah, stressing that the date of publication, so 1932, uh, was uh, in Germany extremely um, an, an extremely tense moment, just one year before uh, Hitler would um, size power. But I think the overall uh, the overall undertone of the book uh, and the topic that he chose uh, were an implicit answer to uh, the claims laid by um, by Carl Schmidt that I very briefly quoted before. So I think there was an attempt in the um, early 20th century Germany to rethink this connection between the political and the um, a theological realm and seminal in that was for sure the 1922 essay on um, by Schmidt on political theology, and he advances the famous thesis in uh, that all modern political concepts are theological concepts secularized. But by saying this, Uber responding directly to the political theology, the Schmidt work. I'm not is saying that, but I, I'm sorry. Is he trying to open up and kind of engage critically with the Schmidt work? So, in in the, in the answer that I'm giving, I'm following an, um, an interpretation that was uh, was given recently by Brody that I quoted, but also by other scholars, which think that um, implicitly, implicitly, Buber was responding to what he perceived as the most dangerous possible connection between uh, theology and, and politics. And he was trying to radically overturn it and, and to, to put it like, to flip it upside down. So in, in, he never quotes Schmidt, but the topic is so close to, to what Schmidt was talking about because Schmidt thematized it in terms of the um, uh, of sovereignty of the ways we organize and we justify and we legitimize sovereignty. So the um, the status of a leader and the uh, legitimacy of the power over other people. The direction that Schmidt took in in his essay and his in his further reading is clearly authoritarian. He also wrote on on, on dictatorship and he argued that. The Weimar Republic in, in Germany was um, a big, de a, a big uh, democratic failure, and uh, instead he argued in favor of uh, of, um, of a dictatorship. I think that the the premises of both works of Buber's work and of um, Schmidt's work are very similar. The similarity lays in the fact that uh, there is no possible uh, this worldly uh, imminent justification for any political leadership. But this leads Schmidt, on the one hand, to point to an authoritarian form of uh, political leadership backed by his understanding of Catholicism. And Buber points to exactly the other direction. So he uh, he delegitimized uh, the uh, any form of power of man of a man and, and says instead there is only the anarcho theocracy so the only thing that we have to uh, recognize is um, the the legitimate rule ruler of of god of a people which is not exercised through any mediator whereas uh, in, in the case of, of Schmidt, it, there's clearly one mediator, the one who correctly reads and interprets the will, the will of God. And for example, um, Carl, Carl Schmidt devoted several essays on, on, on Hobbes and the way Hobbes thinks uh, the, the power and the way Hobbes thinks about the crucial belief 
the, that quote unquote Christ is the Lord, and this is central for um, for Hobbes' system, and and then Schmidt reading Hobbes allows him to construct a very um, an, an almost uh, a justification for an almost totalitarian regime, basically. Buber points towards the uh, the opposite direction. So in in he thinks about he tries to think about um, an 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 anarcho community an anarchist community almost. And and for sure, Buber was influenced by um, by his friend Landauer in this as well. But in this book, this in in, in um, König Thun Gottes, this is. Um, Whereas the the um, anarchistic the, the the anarchic overtone is clear, uh, this is um, provided into um, or, or served in a very in a very academic fashion. Also because he this is this was the what he wrote to 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 get the habilitation for for teaching, at the, so it needed to be accredited. I don't know whether that this helps to provide some context, but to me. It, it makes sense to understand those two figures as two completely opposite way of understanding political theology. And in fact, Buber coined the term theopolitics also probably to distinguish himself from political theology, which are, and are, they are so akin, these two terms. Thanks, Federico. I think that, that's, a, that's a, a, a very comprehensive uh, response. Um, it, it seems to me that so maybe the, if I'm thinking of uh, translating this to the contemporary context, um, or maybe first to the medieval context. So there is a you know Florian Geyer, the 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 leader in the peasant revolts of the of the 14th 15th century, had a had a sword. Bloch writes about this, in which he had engraved the the words nulla crux, nulla corona. Nothing to do with uh, with the cross. Nothing to do with uh, with the crown, um, and uh, so you could say in a kind of revolutionary context, the, the of course people will recognize that theology and politics have a lot to do with each other. But that is that is so. A Marxist or maybe a liberal democrat would say this is a reason to get rid of uh, of of inflated notions of both of them. It is better to to just have a kind of rational debate. Uh, based on consensus or or acceptance of different viewpoints, rather than um, necessitating a kind of return to the theological within the political. Um, and that was my earlier point. It seems to me that what you're trying to do with Buber is to say, well, actually, Buber takes a different view, and this is important for us to think about today. Well, would that be a fair uh, st statement? Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, my, my interest in Buber and why uh, and what I think Buber is trying to um, was trying to do in this book, but not only here. Here, most prominently, is to to highlight the the impossibility uh, to um, disentangle not not not, to, not so much to disentangle, but to distinguish and to separate the political and the theological aspects. Um, so the impossibility to completely secularize political power, I think is quite clear here. And not only for, um, uh, for an authoritarian rule, but also for the anarchic community. And probably this was a bit against the grain, so to say, especially if one considers like the tradition of anarchism from Bakunin most prominently. Um, he, he, he proposed that the anarchist, uh, the anarchist community was in fact something uh, that not only was historically uh, a reality, but while it was an, an historical reality for uh, the people of Israel, um, the, it was so in connection with um, with um, a theological element, in connection with uh, the, 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 rule, the rule of God. So I'd say that for current political debates, um, the attempt to... Um, reduce the political because in my view there it is a reduction of the political to the mere um to the mere administrate and administrative realm or to the mere aspect of positive law this loses uh we, if we do so we lose sight of 
one of the one of the cores of um, of, of the political. And this is uh, why I think that in several aspects, and charisma is one of them, uh, we have to um, consider these these aspects here. Yeah, and this, of course, very important point. I, I think uh, I would like to say that this is a really important point in order to understand the political realm today. Just to 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 point people's attention to the fact that that maybe there's a parallel here in the in the the short passages from I and Dao that you gave us pre-reading, where Buber talks uh, quite quite extensively about the on the one hand the world of institutions, on the one hand and feelings of the other. And on the other, uh, on the other hand, and on, and then uh, uh, contrasts that with the world of relation, which is the world of dialogue and the world of I Dao, and he says so. Institutions are the outward face of of what on the inside uh, it l- looks like feelings, and there is a kind of fragmentation bo- in both, in the institution, uh, and then in its complement to feelings. Whenever we deal with institutions, we get all sorts of feelings, and they are all terrible or, or or nice or we have to deal with them or they're interesting or they get bored but um, feelings is not very different from from relationality and so I think maybe that that's also something that plays in the background let me go um, to the chat so there is here a connect uh, a remark I think uh, honey I, I think you said um, actually this links to this you made a remark about the the center or the builder and the divine in the quote from Buber, would you care to, to uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on that? You have to unmute yourself if you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. I managed to unmute. I just uh, remarked that I like this uh, connection you made, Federico. Federico. Uh, we, because I know the, the concept of the center and the builder, I think mainly from Dan of Non, if you are aware of the book of Dan of Non, but you put it in a new way. For me, it was new, the connection of the builder uh, to other uh, realms of the, of the divine and of the Ruach. It, it was very nice for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I've not done, I've not points to the fact that there is a human, um, yeah. a human element and this human, so he understands the builder as the, the leader of the community in, in a human sense. I think that this is for sure um, a very legitimate reading of it. But if we consider only the, the human side, um, of of, um, of of the center of the community, we lose we lose a, uh, an, an essential element, which is this connection with yeah. or this yeah with this connection with the eternal Tao, I'd say, and 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 this is I, for me quite clear from uh, reading um, from I from I and Tao. I know that uh, I guess Paul also writes. Uh, <laughs> Paul Anders Poor also wrote about this uh, in uh, about this um, the way we can interpret the, the the center of the community. I don't know whether you wanted to say something, Paul, or uh, I might just uh, stop here. I don't want to. Um, I would love to hear what Professor Anders Flo has to say about it. First, I have to commend uh, Enrico on a very dialectically sensitive uh, reading of, of the issues. Um, just in terms of context, of course, these issues were debated um, ever since the, well, ever since, but, uh, but within the German context, particularly within, uh, within uh, the context of the, of the great collapse of, um, of um, of Germany during the, in the wake of the First World War. Max Weber wrote an essay uh, on the issues of what he called politics as polit- politics as a Wissenschaft, um, politics as an invocation. And he tries to make a distinction between, or he explores the distinction between those who felt that politics is a question of ruthlessness and what uh, many of the um, 
the more idealistic um, uh, young men, well, mostly young men uh, and women, uh, wanted to speak about what they call the Gesinnungsethik, a uh, ethic of, of conscience, an ethic of, of, a, of, a, of, a, um, of, and when Buber subscribed to that, an interpersonal sensibility. And then Weber suggests, well, that's not, um, it's good and well, but we need something that's more of a, a dialectic relationship between the power structures and uh, the Gesinnungsethik. Well, going into that is, that is, is ongoing debate within German society. But I think another element that can be brought into discussion is um, uh, theological. Karl Barth's notion of, of, the, of the divine being a source of ultimate um, negation of human hubris. Uh, whatever human beings <laughs> think to be good has to be questioned. Um, and I think that also enters into Buber's ultimately, uh, his understanding of the, of the kingdom of God. Well, clearly we, we have political arrangements, but ultimately we must pause and say, ah, oh, we're not God, we're not divine. Uh, I would just add that to the conversation. Um, but again, I, I applaud uh, very heartily and, and, and truly uh, Frederica's subtle reading of the issues. Um, Yeah, the cult, I, I think, if, if I want to just mention it very briefly, it's also a critique of rabbinic Judaism. <laughs> so, uh, Huna uh, uh, articulated the rabbis obviously saw themselves as an authority, and Buber was critical of the of rabbinic Judaism as well, um, and therefore returned to the Bible in an attempt to read, uh, understand the biblical dynamic uh, as uh, independent of the rabbinic tradition. Um, again, in this dialogical, um, um, sensibility that I sought to bring into the conversation. Um, but one <laughs> ultimate just, uh, issue is that we're not God. <laughs> and we have to be, so we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not God. We're well, beholden to God, but we're not God. Yeah. And Brissette, I'd like, thanks for this, <laughs> for this last <laughs> anti hubris reminder, so to say. Um, but it's interesting for me to note that um, among the German Jewish milieu active at that point in the 1910s, 20s and 30s, uh, especially on the left, on the far left side of the spectrum, there were other authors, and I think Bloch was one of these, Ernst Bloch was one of these, who on the contrary advocated for a form of almost apotheosis, uh, a form of becoming God. So there are two different answers. Wow. The debate was alive in, 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 in that, and you, you pointed out that uh, from, the, from the Christian side, um, Karl Barth's contribution, you know, famously he said that God is a, 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 a big no, a big... Um, uh, a big denial, a big uh, line of no trespassing, so to say. And that was quite clear and quite evident in, in almost paralleled in, 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 in Buber's work, but in other contemporaries and Bloch and Benjamin, but I'd say particularly Bloch, that was not the case. Um, so he, he clearly understood, Bloch clearly understood himself as an heretic and he advocated following another path, which ultimately leads to, to or, or, or is born into uh, Gnostic motives, that the path was that of becoming God because the human essence and the godly essence are ultimately the same. And I think there is so this quite clear distinction among the, um, the, the, the German jury at the left side of the spectrum. And I think that is quite interesting. So there are different ways of thinking about um, an emancipatory political theology. And Buber's and, and, and Bloch's and Benjamin's are quite at odds in this sense. It is very so interesting. Turpo, go on. No, just, <laughs> we do have the notion of imago die, a die, day, that we are somehow you, know, you said it very nicely that we do have the divine in us, uh, and we are to somehow um, seek to emulate God, but constantly aware that we are not. But not to be, uh, and to say that we're not God is can lead us to cynicism. Well, we're not God, <laughs> but there's a tension that Buber obviously wishes to promote um, by 
emphasizing indeed the Imago Dei, a day that we are in the image of God and, and thus beholden to some sense of divinity in our own in ourselves and our relationships. Um, so there's a, a very subtle and, and significant dialectic. That, that feels like a really important dialectic because it's very different from being born into evil in right. a kind of context. The notion that you're born in the image of, well, and, and it's obviously been interpreted in very yeah. different ways, but in the Hebraic tradition, the idea that you're, you're created in the image in all your, not just in your intellect, but in your being, does make a difference and was part of the kind of left libertarian Jewish yeah. tradition in Germany at that period. So, yeah. it, and it does open up very different que questions around authority and obedience, because if we are at some level created in the image, then at some level, we can be our own authority. Mm. And if we can be our own authority, that involves a certain kind of responsibility, which is both moral, but it's also to do with responsibility for our feelings and for our emotions and for our actions. So there's a very uh, deep split where through Rambam, through the Maimonides, is where the notion of being uh, created in the image of God is interpreted in your intellect, you're created in the image of God, not in your body or in your emotions or in your emotional life. So there's that split between what becomes rabbinic Judaism um, and earlier biblical work. And it's really interesting what you say, Paul, about how Buber's critique and questioning of the dominant tradition of rabbinic Judaism and the need to return to the biblical sources, which he's do also doing in this paper and in this context, opens up a very different um, possibility of democratic accountability and being responsible, all those kinds of notions which are in threat. Because at the moment we're living through this incredible moment of deep political crisis, just see what's happening in Sri Lanka and the kind of the levels of uh, public refusals and rightly democratic refusals um, and the very complicated authoritarian politics that's around in the world at the moment means that these questions aren't just theoretical, they're really there to help us understand this very difficult ground that we're now standing on in the middle of a a global ecological crisis. So I think these questions are really important. And thank you, Frederica, for kind of opening up the difference between Weber and Buber and the different possibilities and also between Carl Schmitt and Buber. It's just that I found the reading of this text quite difficult to bring out some of the lessons. And I was just, what that's why I was kind of wondering how it fitted into the larger Buber canon. If I, if I can briefly venture uh, into a into a comment on pre precisely on this difficulty that you said you encountered, and then you said, okay, I I was um, you 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 seem to be pleased by the connections that I tried to make between uh, kingship of God and I and Thou. I think that um, my I might attempt this reading. After 1922, um, we are already, uh, 1923, sorry, uh, Buber um, have already maturated. So the, the, the dialogical philosophy has already um, kind of came, uh, it came to a point of maturity. And so we can consider this book, a book of, uh, in, in, in the period of the dialogical Buber. Nevertheless, you said the tone and the, the writing style is extremely extremely detached and different from the, the, the atmosphere that, so to say, we, we breathe in, in I and Thou. And that the reading that I have it is that this, in a way, is an attempt of um, imbuing, inserting, and almost breathing this atmosphere, this spirit of I and Thou into the academic world. And this is how it looks like. 
And it is a parallel to what a leader might do in the attempt of breathing into the world of institutions. So it nourishes it, but it has to embrace the, 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 the tenets of it. So it has to, to um, abide by the rules of the German academia in the same way a leader has to uh, abide by and, and, and formulate uh, laws that are, um, that are made according to, to certain principles. So uh, probably it loses something of the fascination and of the immediacy that uh, one might feel while reading I and Tao. But at the same time, it is, I would say, a necessary work if we want to, um, if we want other spheres to, to be, um, to breathe this atmosphere. This is at least my, the way I read this book, um, because I think the, here and there one can sense this, but of course it's expressed in a, in a very rigorous academic um, um, language and jargon. I don't know whether you'd agree with this, uh, Vic. <laughs> or... I think it's a bit schizoid. I just don't know how people can do both at the same time. So I, I, I just kind of wonder. So that's why I was just kind of the difficulty of doing. And I suppose I just, just wanted more questions within this rigorous text. Um, more sense of direction, more sense of where it's going to fit into his other work. So I was just kind of wary, partly. I was just kind of, and I can understand the academic necessity and the habilitation and all that. Um, but the, the spirit with which it's written, in, even in the context in terms of, it might be because you focused on uh, Weber rather than Schmidt in terms of how to think about it, but also how, whether the notion of charisma that Uber ends up with and the way that you want to think about it in terms of Ruach, whether, you know, whether, you know, just how, how to hold on to it, you know? In, in you know, and we, because at the moment we're thinking of, uh, if we think of Trump or if we think of kind of charismatic, um, populist leaders in the present that we're engaging in with what we're trying to understand is how they have the support that they do have and what are the critical intellectual resources that we need to develop in order to undercut um, that. Do we then think, oh, no, here's an alternative vision of charisma, you know, that we can counter with it, or do we think about notions of democratic accountability? Do we need to think in and good authority? Do we need to think in radically different moral and political terms? And then what's the relationship between, um, how do we think the relationship between law and uh, uh, and ethics? And is, is law to be seen in positive terms? We just have to accept it. There's just, uh, just a few weeks ago, the death of the Israeli political and legal philosopher, Joseph Raz, who did really interesting work as a kind of legal populist about notions of kind of liberal perfectionism. And you could see low, no, notions of liberal perfectionism with the way that he was trying to maintain a kind of positive, you know, a vision of creative individuality within a kind of liberal tradition, but then didn't know how to think about the relationship between morality and law. And that question, which Buber does, constantly kind of go backwards and forwards what like what is that relationship between morality and law and how are we to be able to think that relationship i think is a really important question well i i, I think that that's that is a, a very eloquent summary of 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 the 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 points that that federico was uh, was was putting forward yeah yeah i mean my my main point in this uh, is related to one of the questions that you that you just raised, and so um, we we are faced with um, many authoritarian leaders uh, that, and we are also worried about the consequences of uh, of them at the lead of, of nation states of, of of entire countries and so on. And so, the on the one hand, from the sheer political point of view, of course, we need some means to to counter or to curb the. 
um, the, the, the uh, detrimental activities that some of these charismatic leaders are carrying out. On the other hand, while we think about conceptually and we act politically to curb this and to prevent the dangerous outcomes of their political activity, we this is what I'd suggest following Buber. We, I, th I think it would be wrong or it would be um, just uh, impoverishing to uh, let the notion of charisma go because the the one could be tempted to say, okay, to prevent this, to prevent any authoritarian leader or any charismatic leader to um, develop into an, an authoritarian one, we need a, a technical government where there's just the maximum of efficiency there and every cult of personality is avoided. Now, this is something that also worries me. And I think that holding on to a specific notion of charisma and a specific uh, notion of uh, in this sense can help us to rethink uh, to uh, the, 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 the political sphere. And that is that should be maintained because um, you, you see that we are, we are facing two, two opposite poles. One is the uh, autocratic leader, the other one, the technocratic one. And I think that none of the, the two would be a good answer to the current political crisis. So going back to the, uh, going back to uh, what I, following people perceive as the core of politics can be the first step to then rethink it. But this, of course, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we have also to curb or contain or even to counter the um, the, 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 the the current uh, almost uh, yeah the the, the current authoritarian leaders. If I may just uh, underscore what I think uh, uh, Federico pointed out before, uh, perhaps too quickly, is that Karis Karis excuse me, I have something my, problem with my speech. Uh, Kuris um, can be understood as Ruach. The full expression, of course, is Ruach Elohim, uh, the Spirit of God. And yeah. just a quick reference to uh, what is often difficult to understand in the third part of I Am Vow, where we speaks about uh, the eternal, God, uh, eternal vow, um, the lines of eternal vow being extended into the, the human encounter. Those lines, I believe, real, can be understood as Ruach Elohim. Um, which brings us back to the issue of uh, Imago Dei, that we're not, although we are to be humble, <laughs> and we're within that God, yet we are somehow beholden to God, and beholden to God in the sense that we are to, to respond to the to, to divine in each of us, the divine, if you wish, and, uh, in our, that comes is manifest in our in encounters with one another. Um, but um, that's bringing us back to the poetic language <laughs> that uh, of, uh, of I am thou, but... Uh, but, um, there, uh, is, there is, a, there is a, a long relation between poetry and politics, and some of the. Yeah, right. yeah. Some but, of the yeah. but to say that po po uh, the poetic should not be eliminated from the politics, uh, oriented in human relationships. If you understand poetry is somehow um, um, seeking the transcendent um, beyond the, the, the grasp of ordinary language. Um, you know, yes, yeah, so that's it. Invoking the if you wish, the Ruach, <laughs> the spirit, uh, the divine within each of us. It, it is, a, if I can, can, can say that, I think this, this is very important, I think we are getting somewhere with this, that, that the founding of the, of the political sphere or the founding of a nation or the founding of whatever it is that you want to fight for, um, that's a poetical act. And, um, and you can, I mean, uh, you know, Heidegger writes endlessly about the, the, the words of the poets, which last uh, and because they found a, a mode of being. And, and that becomes a foundation for the political. And I think this is as much a danger as, a, as the point that Federico is trying to make. This is as much a danger as something that we need to not forget about, being beholden to God. Um, and in Buber, we get a, a relational view of that. And that, that might be one of the things to, 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 to bear in mind. I just had a footnote. Yeah. I have a very good colleague in Jerusalem, some of you may know Christoph Schmidt, uh, who has written on uh, political theology extensively. He just completed a paper on, on uh, a circle of, of German Jewish intellectuals in Jerusalem reading Hodelin. 
Uh, yes, precisely. I was going to say that the, the Germans, they sent, the, I said that at some point, they sent the, the soldiers into the battlefield with Hölderlin in their backpacks. Right. What would have happened if they had chosen Iron Dow instead? Yeah, it would not, <laughs> would not have been a war. <laughs> yeah, um, this is the exactly good point. So Hölderlin is very, you see in Hölderlin exactly the same. On the one hand, there is this notion of, of total of, of real freedom, the ideas of the French Revolution. The Hölderlin that Bloch always tried to exalt, but then Hölderlin is also the das Dumpfe that das mit Heidegger kommt. Um, Marcus, you had a comment. Could you would you care to elaborate? Yeah, there's also one by by Sylvia before, but yes. Oh, oh Sylvia, sorry, I I was I, I maybe we should go to first Sylvia and then to if she was first and then to Marcus. But if Sylvia is not responding, then maybe she can come a bit later. Yeah, and then Marcus, please go ahead. And then we have Honey. Yeah, Marcus. Thank you, uh, John. Thank you very much, uh, Federico. That was excellent. Um, I really liked the way you presented that. I wonder. I, 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 I kind of when you started to compare the autocratic leaders. I had this nasty feeling that some of the non-autocratic leaders, the ones we consider to be dem democratic leaders, for example, Netanyahu and even Johnson here in the UK, um, seem to be doing, making a lot of effort to acquire the powers of the autocratic leaders. Um, they're kind of managing their, their affairs in a kind of a hierarchical manner. They're attempting to... Um, restrain the freedom of citizens by passing laws and other such things. Um, I wonder to what extent the problem of charisma has to be tied into the issue of power. Because you have charismatic leaders who, who are very charismatic, but do not have terribly much power to achieve their goals. And perhaps Obama was one of them, uh, where you have uh, charismatic leaders like uh, Trump, who did manage to achieve a lot of his goals and it didn't really matter to him by what method he achieved them, but he used his power whenever he could. So I wonder where where the where charisma and power come into the the equation. And also, I mean, it, it occurs to me that, that Buber, when living in, in Israel, um, had Ben-Gurion as one of his uh, interlocutors. And Ben-Gurion had a great deal of charisma. And Buber, in all of his efforts, didn't really manage to to change the mindset of of, uh, of uh, Ben Gurion in any way whatsoever, because really to to have true charisma, you need you need leaders with trust who 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 have relationships of trust, who show compassion, empathy, are prepared to listen to the citizens. And the interesting thing today is that it seems to be that the female leaders are able to, to provide that kind of environment much more so than the men. Now, I know there is an argument against that when you look at some female leaders, for example, Margaret Thatcher or even Golda Meir, who perhaps are the antithesis to that. But the current level seems to be that, that female leaders are able to exhibit some of these uh, criteria, category um, characteristics in a better way than men can. But, but really, my issue is charisma and power. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Marcus, for, uh, for the comments, for the question. So um, the first part of my speech was an introduction, so it was extremely sketchy. And I think it deals with uh, like a, a sphere that of political science I might be less familiar with. But while preparing for this talk, I um, I read a couple of papers, one of which was dealing with the, um, the uh, what I call the quasi-democracies or those hybrids between democracies and authoritarian regimes. So I looked at uh, like Eastern Europe and, and, and Russia and let's say all the ex-Soviet states, all the stands. And in this paper, they were suggesting that the authoritarian rule always lays claim to be a, a, um, to be a rule of the people to be democratic. So even the more the most authoritarian leaders keep um, 
maintaining or keep claiming that their rule is justified because they embody or they summarize and they advance the will of the people. So, and they present themselves or attempt to present themselves in democratic terms. Now, this is what um, is quite easy to say, it's uh, quite easy to see it's at odds at, with the, the, the political um, reality in these states. With Western Europe and America, I think the distinction is a bit more subtle. I mean, I mean, it's it's debatable, for example, whether Boris Johnson is uh, directly trying to uh, uh, overturn the, the, the democracy in the UK or not. And I think, or, or, or what Trump did in Trump case, we have an, an instance, a quite quite a clear instance. Uh, uh, of doing this just past the elections uh, when when Biden was elected. I mean, I'd say that there are some more um, some some political contexts in which the rule of law is more difficult to overturn, and in that sense, and in, in these contexts, uh, the, the the charismatic leadership is limited by uh, the rule of law for sure. In the other cases where one can overstep the rule of law um, and where one can change the constitution and, 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 and when the leader can, can grasp more power, in that case, it becomes extremely dangerous um, because of this. Um, but I don't know whether this was the, the core of your question because you, you, um, it, it seemed to me that you also pointed to the link between charisma and actual political agency. So what one can do. Um, and, and, and sometimes charisma is limited by a limited political agency, by, by a, a very strict um, system of law or by just the numbers in parliament, as you you, you quoted the example of, of, of Obama and some of the policies he tried to pass were just limited by, by this. So I it, think it also depends on the circumstances, but yeah. Yeah, thanks. I think what I was trying to ask was, can you really have charisma if it's only based on power and not based on on being able to be, become involved in relationships of trust and compassion and empathy? I mean, is that really charisma or is it something different? I think that was well, my it, question. It, it, it is charisma in, a, in the most, let's say, um, common way to understand it. Um, it is it is charisma because um, if, if we understand just charisma with this extraordinary capacity or with the acknowledgement of an extraordinary capacity in the leader, then it is charisma. But my, my whole point of the, of, of the talk was this is just an instrumental, so to say, understanding of, of charisma and actual charisma is something that is re related to the or as is all pointed out. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Federico. I think in the in the chat we have uh, Hani who asks, is the analysis of political leadership very different from the analysis of the management of boss role? I think uh, um, uh, in the interest of time, maybe we can say that, uh, uh, Jessica, yeah, thank you. See, you. see you next time Thanks, for being here. Um, we, we can say that that's, that's precisely the point. What is the state of this charisma? And where is charisma instrumentalized in the name of a managerial approach? Or where is it, uh, is it this spirit of, of, of God? Um, and you say you give up. Why, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's fine. And then there was um, a final question, but I see the hand has, has disappeared. Uh -huh. I mean, like I'm still here, but I don't want to. Uh, well, yeah, no, I was, I was going. Yeah, it's, 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 it's time to stop. So I want to give you the chance to to voice your question right, right before we stop. It can be yes or no, just because I was curious about uh, the use of the words uh, uh, authority and the leadership and leader. And since I know that in German, you know, Führer as leader and Italian Duce wouldn't have been uh, that, the same kind of positive connotation that the word leader has uh, as in English. But I just wanted to ask if, because I do see a difference in those two words, is 
uh, I wanted to ask if in the, the philosophical, philosophical discussion around them and Buber and Max Weber, there is a, such a distinction, a uh, semantic distinguish. Yeah. I mean, very short, yes, there is. And in fact, uh, I, I, I tried to point out that the different difficulties in translating the notion of Herrschaft um, which uh, which uses um, Max Weber, and uh, yeah, in in the in the case of which is different from Führer, and in the case of the, the word uh, the word authority, I think uh, it's probably the best fit in translation because um, in in this sense it is the one whose authority is recognized. And I think this, this moment of recognition of authority is, is, is crucial in the case of uh, the charismatic leader. But... Uh, okay, and, that's what I wanted to know. <laughs> uh, Aunt, Auntie will suggest that we refer to Latin uh, as a way out of the malaise. I can oh. just make one quick... Uh, yeah. Going back to the uh, kinship of God, um, Buber suggests that or reminds us that in the, the biblical context there was great hesitancy about a, appointing a king uh, and a king who have somehow um, uh, fused charisma with power uh, so the question raised by marcus is there's an ambivalence uh, uh, a very alert ambivalence so to speak within the biblical tradition that uh, power and charisma have to un have to have an uneasy relationship, uh, if one at all. Um, or just to, uh, so the title of Buber's book, Kingship of God, not the kingship of men and women, but the kingship of God. Um, and of course, there was the ultimate compromise um, that um, Buber felt was um, uh, uh, realized with a great deal of reluctance to have a king as opposed to a, a political king, a politically appointed king. Um, so the, the issue of charisma and power is clearly problem, problematized, thematized by Buber, his reading of the, of the Hebrew scripture. Okay, thank, thank you very much. So Emmanuel, thank you for, the, for this, uh, this uh, semantic question at the end, which is a very central one. Um, thank you, Federico, for leading us in, in the deep dive into the diagnosis of uh, what is ailing politics at the moment and how we can help, how we can use Boober to understand that a little bit better. Uh, I think we covered a lot of ground, so I want to thank you for that and um, thank everyone else for participating and for being here again. The next session of the, the seminar in dialogue with Martin Boober will take place on the 6th of June. Um, as, as, as always, you have to register for this in advance via the, the SAS website now. The link also appears on the, on the uh, Global Learhouse uh, web page. But you have to do that because if you don't do it, you won't get the link that you need to join the Zoom meeting. I'm looking forward to seeing you all back on the 6th of June. And, um, and I wish you all a good day or a good evening, wherever you are, or a good night.